record, go, 9.30, all right. So um, what we were working on on uh, Monday and Wednesday, so Monday we looked at tertiary structure, that is the overall 3D confirmation of one protein, and then at the end of Wednesday, we started to look at the idea of quaternary structure. Uh, quaternary structure is just looking at the 3D confirmation of multiple proteins that are coming together, or multiple peptides rather, that are coming together to form one protein. All right? And we, we ended on talking about this idea of symmetry. That's where we left off at. So we're going to continue to talk about this idea of um, where proteins are located inside, or where amino acids are located inside of a protein, rather. And I've gotten quite a few questions this semester about, like, when is an amino acid hydrophobic? When isn't it hydrophobic? And so up to this point, all we had to do is like memorize which ones are and which ones aren't. That mainly has to do with what is the side chain. If it's carbon and hydrogens only, it's usually hydrophobic. Well, there are actually experiments that are done to determine if an amino acid is hydrophobic or not. And these scores you're seeing on this table to the left basically determines how hydrophobic the amino acid is. High, high hydropathy scores mean hydrophobic, very hydrophobic. Negative means hydrophilic. And there are many ways for this experiment to be done. Um, one way for this experiment to be done is that you have a mixture of water and then uh, above that you have oil and you just put the side chain of amino acid into this mixture and you ask yourself, where does it appear more? Does it appear in the oil or does it appear in the water? And you do some fancy calculations to get a free energy from that. And from those free energies, you can get a score. Um, but all we need to really know is this idea, oh no, my internet connection is unstable. Okay, I might have cut off there for a second because it looks like my internet connection was unstable there. But all, all we need to know is what does a hydropathy score mean? Or high numbers are hydrophobic, negative numbers are hydrophilic. And we need to know this idea that, you know, it's a hydrophobic effect that's folding proteins. Um, and that's, if you go back to um, the beginning of the semester, we talked about how water does not want to interact with hydrophobic amino acids. We form these cages around these hydrophobic uh, groups. Um, and what we can do actually is if we have a primary sequence of a protein, you remember the primary sequence is simply the N to C terminus, just what amino acids are in this protein. We can make something called a hydropathic index, or it's really a hydrophobicity scale. But what you do is you look at each amino acid and you do a what's called a running average. Um, let me just talk about running average for a second. Um, so what a running average is, let's say these are all amino acids and you wanna know how hydrophobic, um, this, this area is. So let's say I was interested about this amino acid. Basically a running average is you just keep a window and you keep moving that window over. So like you might take the average of like six amino acids, then the next day, or sorry, the next amino acid you take the average of the six amino acids next to it. Um, you might have seen this actually with uh, COVID. So a lot of the times when you look at COVID um, data, what you'll see, if you're talking about cases or deaths, what you'll see are bars that represent raw numbers. And then you'll see this line 
this line is the running average where it will say, I'm gonna take all of last week's data and I'll make my data point here, right? I'm gonna take all the data that happened last week, that's my new average. It's the same idea with this chart down here. I'm gonna look at like seven amino acids before me. I'm gonna average how hydrophobic they are and I'm gonna get that score for my hydrophobicity plot right here and put it there, all right? But what we need to really know is how to read a plot like this. And basically what this is saying is that if you are a positive hydrophobic score, then you're hydrophobic. If you're a negative hydrophobic score, then you're not hydrophobic. So with this, we can begin to understand like where are the hydrophobic patches in our protein. Any questions about those ideas? Will there be a table or a graph? Um, I might ask you to read this graph and this table and tell me what it means. That's a possibility, yeah. I'm not gonna ask you to remember these numbers, but I do expect you to know what a positive number means, what a negative number means, yes. Why are the peaks so high when the side chain numbers are not more than five or less than five? Um, so that has to do with like this running average, where it's like if you have like five hydrophobic amino acids in a row, that score is just gonna keep climbing, 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 right? So maybe like average wasn't the right word, it's more like a running tally, where it's like hydrophobic, 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 all those are positive numbers, so your score keeps going up. Then if it goes hydrophilic, 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 all those negatives, all those numbers are negative, so your score goes down. So that's kind of what's going on there. You're, you're looking at your neighbors and tallying, tallying up what your score is at that given point. So yeah, average was a bad choice of words um, there for me. Any other questions? All right, let's see if you got this in. I want you to draw me a hydropathic index plot, basically the plot you see below you, for a protein that has seven domains. And these seven domains will go through the lipid membrane. So that's what I want you to do for me first. Draw that plot. Then, if you have that plot, The next question is, we can randomly link together amino acids in a lab. That's super easy. However, if we do that, our peptide, our protein, will not dissolve in water. Yet, any naturally occurring protein of the same length will be soluble most of the time. Explain why that is. So first, draw that plot for me for A. And then once you have an idea for a plot, think about B. So give everybody a couple minutes to do that. Let me draw a picture of what this protein in A might look like. Um, that might help.
So this little road is my membrane. Let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Each one of these is a domain. So domain one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's that plot look like? Our hydrophobic plot, Our hydrophobicity plot. Do, 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 do. Drawing me a plot. Drawing me a plot. Unfortunately, I can't really see your plots, which is not ideal, but let me draw what you should have got. No, oh, that's not a straight line, but I'll do. Um, so, positive numbers, hydrophobic. Negative numbers, hydrophilic. Uh, we start, the end terminus is in the cytoplasm, or it could be on the outside of the cell. But So it starts on our cytoplasm. Here's domain one going through the membrane. Then we go outside the membrane. Domain two, domain three, domain four, domain five, domain six, domain seven. So I'm gonna call that D1, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So through this, if, if you didn't know what a protein looked like, all right, and you looked at a hydrophobicity plot, like you knew what the sequence was, and you saw something like this, that would be a pretty good indication that this protein is going through the membrane, right? Because you have these hydrophobic patches followed by a hydrophilic patch. So it's saying, you know, part of my protein here is hydrophobic, then it goes immediately hydrophilic back to hydrophobic, switching back and forth. Um, what that is telling us is that we have seven parts of the protein in our membrane, right? So remember, our membrane is hydrophobic, and so that's why we have uh, these peaks um, up here in the positive region. Now on a test, of course, I can't really ask you to draw that, um, but I might give you a plot and ask you some questions around that. So make sure you know how to read this hydrophobicity plot. Make sure you know what positive and negative numbers actually mean. Uh, so the parts of the membrane that are hydrophobic, everything inside is hydrophobic. And then everything outside and at the heads is hydrophilic. So my blue is hydrophilic, my black is hydrophobic, right? Because the membrane is made out of lipids and a lipid has a polar head or charged head and has nonpolar tails. So the tails are interacting between our heads and so that's, that's what is being shown there. So any other questions about that idea? What is black color? Black would be me showing hydrophobic on the membrane. Blue is hydrophilic. All right, so let's think about B then. B, I can make a protein in the lab. And if I randomly just, you know, one out of 20 chance, any amino acid can be at any position, that protein will probably not go into water. It will be insoluble. But if I compare that protein to 
a protein of the same size in nature, that protein will probably be soluble. Why, if I randomly put amino acids on, on a peptide, why won't that dissolve in water? Let's see how much we know about proteins based on what we've talked about. Yeah, this is one of those big brain, big thinking, critical thinking questions, right? You're not gonna find an answer for this in a textbook. You have to take the information we talked about Nobody should commit tax fraud because one, I'm not smart enough to do it. Two, you're not powerful enough to do it, so you will get caught. Yeah. If you want to commit tax fraud, you better have some friends in high places because that's one thing the U.S. government does not. You can do a lot of stuff illegally in the U.S. and get away with it. Tax fraud's not one of them. You mess with money, you're going to jail. Yeah, anyways, before my internet just crashed, the first message I literally saw in the group chat since I got back was tax fraud. So who wants to answer B? If you already answered it, copy and paste because my internet crashed beforehand. Why if I randomly put amino acids together in a peptide, it does not, it will not go into water. And like I was saying before I, I crashed, this is one of those critical thinking, big brain questions that you won't find in a textbook. So you have to use the information we've talked about, turn it over, think about it in new directions and synthesize it to answer this new question. Um, so most, so naturally occurring peptides are folded with chaperones. Most proteins don't need a chaperone. Um, only a few proteins need chaperones. Yeah, so if it's, the question is if I, let's say I want to create a protein that's 100 amino acids. And at each position, I roll a 20-sided dice for those D and D fans out there. I roll a 20-sided dice, and that picks what amino acid I use at that position. 99% of the time, that protein's not going to go into water. While if I look at any like other protein that's 100 amino acids in length in nature, those do go into water. So, what's the difference? Why won't that dissolve? And if just to go on what Angela was saying there, um, if, if a protein's not soluble, right, a chaperone would help, but something had to go very wrong for that protein uh, for it not to be soluble. Everything is mostly water on the inside. The inside of a cell, yeah. So on the inside of it, let's say I made the same set conditions. I have a beaker that has the same things in it as a cell. And I put my protein in there, the one I made in the lab. It won't go, it won't dissolve in. Why? I guess, let me help you with your thinking. What makes a protein dissolve in water? Why, what makes something not dissolve in water? Polarity. So is it one polar side chain connected with a non-polar side chain? So for any polypeptide, right, I connect the backbones. And all I'm saying is that I randomly choose what amino acids there. So if it's polar, non-polar, polar, non-polar, non that would be by chance, but that might have something to do with it. Non-polar is unsoluble, polar is soluble. So, but you know, 
a lot of proteins do have nonpolar groups and they're perfectly soluble as well. So what's going on? Again, big brain, big thought question. When people say critical thinking, they mean questions like this. A random sequence of the synthetic peptide cannot direct a coherent folding process. Uh, yeah, more or less. Um, that is a very academic way to put it, and that, that's good. Uh, so that's how I would probably say it. Um, so let, there are two ways your protein can be soluble in, in water inside the cell. One, if it has no nonpolar group, or yeah, no nonpolar groups, or no hydrophobic groups. If your protein has no hydrophobic groups, it will definitely be um, um, soluble in water. If I'm randomly choosing amino acids, the chances of that are like zero. So there will be hydrophobic groups in my protein. Um, so it doesn't have to do, so the, the, uh, one of the answers is, is it because naturally occurring polypeptides of the same length is usually soluble in aqueous solution due to presence of large amino acid side chains with reactive functional groups? No, because in my fake peptide, I can make the same large amino acids and functional groups. So how to be soluble? Choice one. No nonpolar hydrophobic groups. This is impossible in my situation. That happens in nature. We do have peptides like that, but not here. Two, hydrophobic core. All right. So for a protein to be soluble, if it has hydrophobic groups, it has to form a hydrophobic core. And this is what I was kind of getting at. Do you understand the idea of a hydrophobic core? So all of the amino acids are hydrophobic, are pushed together and they're hidden away. So they do not interact with water. Instead, polar groups interact with water. So that means that any protein that is soluble has evolved over time to properly fold so that their hydrophobic groups are gonna be pushed away. Um, so they have, gone, they, they have gone through that trial and error to make sure the, the nonpolar amino acids are in the right place. If I just randomly put amino acids everywhere, there's no guarantee that they're gonna all conglomerate in the center and have nothing but nonpolar amino, or sorry, nothing but polar amino acids on the outside. Chances of that are very small. What will happen is that water will just put multiple peptides together. They'll push, like, just say, okay, there's hydrophobic groups here. I don't want to interact. You guys kind of just smush together. And what will happen is that you'll form a giant protein ball of just random stuff all mixed in there. This ball will get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it will just crash out a solution. So, Proteins have evolved over time so that their hydrophobic groups generally don't interact with anything else in the cell. They get pushed in towards the center to form that hydrophobic core, and the outside is a polar layer. Proteins have evolved over time where hydrophobic groups are inside and hydrophilic groups are on the outside for the most part. It's kind of like the phospholipid bilayer. It's exactly like the phospholipid bilayer, right? They, it, it, it's just not as like nice and ordered as the bilayer. They're kind of just smushed in there, but it's the same exact idea. If you have a hydrophobic core, won't that part be insoluble? Like the outside is soluble while the inside's insoluble. Yes, the, out, the inside is insoluble. But as long as, the, as long as water doesn't see that and it can interact with the outside and the outside's all polar, then the protein as a whole will dissolve, right? Because it's interacting with water. Being insoluble means you don't want to interact with water. The hydrophobic effect, if I have a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids trying to interact with water, water won't like that. And so it's going to push these groups together 
and it's going to build and build and build to create a giant ball. What was the answer? The answer is that, okay, so there's two parts to that answer, like I said. One, either a protein inside of a cell does not have any hydrophobic groups, which doesn't happen if I'm randomly choosing amino acids. Two, uh, naturally occurring proteins that do have hydrophobic groups can form a hydrophobic core. The creation of this core has been fine-tuned over millions of years so that nonpolar amino acids are at specific points, they're in specific locations of the protein to perfectly make this core. If I randomly put hydrophobic amino acids on a peptide, then the chances of them forming a core naturally are very low. What will happen is that they will interact with other hydrophobic parts of the cell, conglomerate into a giant mess, and crash out of solution. So that's there is, for that question. That's not like a simple like two sentence thing. That's one of those. When I see this question on a test, I need to answer in at least like a paragraph to two paragraphs type of question because that's taken a lot of information we've learned and trying to synthesize it into this answer. That's why it's critical thinking. All right. Let's move on to our next idea. So like I just stated in the previous slide, hydrophobic interactions are super important. Um, but they're not the only interactions that matter when folding a protein. They're, the hydrophobic interactions are probably the most important, but other things uh, uh, contribute to um, protein stability. So hydrogen bonds. When you're folding, you might not fold all the way completely at first, right? You'll need hydrogen bonds to fine tune your 3D structure. So um, hydrogen bonds can help fine tuning those details to make sure you're in the exact conformation you need to be. Also, ion pairs or salt bridges are super important as well. Um, a salt bridge is a negative and positive group interacting. In this case, it's a negative amino acid and a positive amino acid interacting. So again, these ion pairs can almost be like glue in that well, not, not quite like glue, more like tape, in that they can help stick pieces of your protein together. And I say tape because you can break these ion pairs and it's not too hard. Um, any ion pair that's in the inside of your protein in your hydrophobic core, those are super hard to break. So if they're on the outside, um, they, will, they won't interact, but it's easy for them to break. If it's on the inside, they will stick together like magnets and they will hold that part of the protein together um, super well. Yes, if, so if I make a peptide in the lab and it's all non all polar groups, then it can probably be soluble. But since I said I'm randomly picking amino acids, that probably won't happen, right? If I have 100 amino acids to pick from, all right, sorry, my protein's 100 amino acids long, and every position, I just randomly pick an amino acid to be there. Chances are hydrophobics are going to be in there. Are salt bridges similar to disulfide bonds then? No. And the reason why is that salt bridges are non-covalent. These form an ionic bond or ionic, not even a bond, it is a bond. It's more like an ionic interaction. Like I, I hesitate to call that a bond. It's more like an ionic interaction. Uh, while a disulfide, when we have two cysteines coming together, that is a covalent bond. So that's why I said a salt bridge is like tape. It, it will stick together, but you can break it. Your, um, Disulfide is like Gorilla Glue. You are not breaking a disulfide unless you have some special chemical come in or some special enzyme. A covalent, or sorry, a disulfide bond, uh, this covalent bond will 
stick pieces of the protein together and that's not breaking apart. You are not removing a, a um, disulfide bond unless you change conditions or if you add a special chemical like urea or if you have an enzyme. So thinking about all these interactions. So I hope you guys really like chemistry because this is chemistry right here, right? If I change pH, what would happen to my quaternary structure? And what would be changed? How, what, what interactions would be changed? Which one's like a magnet again? That's your salt bridge. Will pH mess up bonding interactions and change the shape? Yes. pH, if I change pH, that will mess up bonds and the shape of the protein will change. What bonds, what interactions am I messing up by doing that? Uh, denatured, because the salt interaction will change. Yeah, that's one thing that'll change. Your salt bridges, if I change pH, either arginine would become neutral or asp would become neutral, right? And so that strong interaction will go away. So salt bridges will be broken, which can lead to denaturation. Your protein will no longer be in this 3D shape. What other interaction that we talked about will change if I change pH? What other interaction that's actually on this slide? Why, do, why does DNA denature at high pH? Hydrogen bonds, yes. So when you change pH, you are protonating or deprotonating something that will break hydrogen bonds or form new hydrogen bonds that you don't want to form. So you're going to be breaking these hydrogen bonds and your structure will start to fall apart. So if you go in extreme pHs, like if, if a protein is meant to be at seven and you put it in a solution of a pH of nine or a pH of five, that protein will probably unfold. If you take a P, uh, protein that's found in your stomach where you know pH is like two and you put that at a pH of seven, that protein will unfold too because it, it's taken off its natural environment. So these charges, these salt bridges, these Hydrogen bonds are critical for forming the overall 3D shape of a protein. Not only, only tertiary structure, which is three, uh, 3D of one protein, but quaternary structure, which is 3D of multiple proteins coming together. Questions about that? Nothing happens to covalent bonds. Nope. pH does not break covalent bonds unless you have, well, pH will break covalent bonds of like oxygen and hydrogen, nitrogen and hydrogen. But if I have a carbon-carbon bond and I go to pH of one, that, that's not going to break a carbon-carbon bond. So can it go from acidic to neutral and vice versa? Basically, what I would say is that any pro every single protein only works at a specific pH. Different proteins work at different pHs. Like those in your stomach work at a pH of like one. Those in tears work at a pH of like nine or 10. Most proteins work at a pH of seven. If you take a protein and put it in a different pH than what it's supposed to be, than what it was naturally evolved to be in, you are going to ruin that protein because you are changing all these interactions. If you take it, it out of a spe specific pH and put it back, well, refold no refold no problemo. Probably not. We're going to talk about that, but most proteins, once unfolded, are gone. Um, just like you cook an egg, eggs made out of proteins. 
if I take an egg and cook it, can I revert it back to an egg? No, because I took that, those proteins and denatured them. So once denatured, they're probably gone forever. That's why it's very important to use buffers. Okay. Speaking of renaturation, let me tell you of a scientist who was extremely lucky. It's better to be lucky than good. This, this researcher is named An Anfinson, I think, or An Anfinson, something like that. What he did is that he took the protein ribonuclease A and he broke all of the disulfide bonds with 8M urea. Then what he did is he took the urea away. And what he found is that when he denatured this RNAs A, and he took away the urea so it could fold up, roughly like 99% of that protein refolded correctly. What this tells us is that primary structure this goes along to the question we asked about randomly putting amino acids together. Primary structure dictates, dictates, I don't know how to spell dictates. I didn't study English. Primary structure dictates 3D structure. That is, a protein has all the information it needs in its primary structure to create its secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Now, his theory is right. His idea is right in that primary structure dictates this. I was saying he's lucky because he picked one of the few proteins that actually does this. Dictates, yes, D-I-C-T-A-T-E-S. I knew there was a C. I probably would have put more than one I. All right, yeah, so primary structure dictates, I even have it written down, wow, dictates 3D structure, all right? That's the main takeaway here. That is a big idea in biochemistry. For a protein to fold, it has everything it needs. It, the amino acid sequence dictates how, how it folds. And we already answered this question. Given enough time, will all denature proteins renature? No. In fact, most proteins do not refold. And the reason is, if you unfold a protein, those hydrophobic groups are gonna be exposed. So you're taking this hydrophobic core and you're re-exposing them to liquid. And if I have like, three copies of a protein, and now I have big old hydrophobic groups sticking out, one thing water will do is that it's just gonna smash these proteins together and make a ball, you know, like this, a random ball where all these hydrophobic groups are now hidden. And let's say I was doing an experiment, I added salt, or I added pH rather, let's go with pH. I added pH to make my protein unfold and then I reverted the pH back to its natural case. Well, if all my proteins are in a tangled ball because water pushed them there so it wouldn't have to interact with hydrophobic groups, it's like trying to untangle like a ball of like, like cords or a ball of string. That's not gonna happen, it's stuck. So most proteins do not um, naturally refold once unfolded. Some proteins do, like ribonuclease A, but most proteins don't. Questions about that idea? Primary structure dictates tertiary structure. Scientific way to say that, um, when, uh, okay, 
So when a protein, you sound just like my, my boss when I was in grad school who would always say, stop talking to me like you talk to other people, talk scientifically. Yeah, when you unfold the protein, you are exposing its hydrophobic groups to um, uh, the aqueous environment, right? Water has an unfavorable interaction with hydrophobic groups because it can't hydrogen bond. Therefore, water will force or push hydrophobic groups to interact with each other and away from water. When this happens, multiple peptide strands can come together and aggregate. And you're going to have this mass aggregation of multiple peptide chains, right? And so if I try to revert these um, unfolded proteins back to the folded state, I have to um, undo my aggregation. To do that randomly is not possible because you're going to have some amino acids that are making new favorable um, intermolecular interactions, right, that are non-native. And so these non-native interactions, why would they want to break? They're happy now. It's not the 3D conformation, but they're, they're hydrogen bonding to things. The hydrophobic groups are happy. They have no reason to become unaggregated, right? So they're going to stick that way. That is the over-scientifically way to say it. The way to say it, like not scientifically, is that all the proteins ball up together because of the hydrophobic groups, and it's hard to take apart that ball. Either way works with me. All right. But the big thing, primary structure dictates 3D structure. The last thing we're going to talk about, and if you notice, we did not get to today's lecture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push all the folders back again. They take like 40 minutes to do that on Blackboard. Um, what that means is you don't have a reading guide on Monday, but you do have homework for Sunday. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about today are what are called IDPs or intrinsically disordered proteins. So what an IDP is, it's a protein that doesn't have a fixed overall 3D shape. Um, think wet spaghetti inside the cell that's constantly moving. These proteins, they usually have charged amino acids and no hydrophobic groups, which we talked about. If you have no hydrophobic groups, you're not gonna form a core. You're just gonna be like a whip. Um, moving around. When a protein is unfolded, the hydrophobic groups will be exposed and water will aggregate these peptides together in mass. Aggregation cannot unfold back naturally to original form. Yeah, that works. All right. Now, what's interesting is that if we look at eukaryotic proteins, over half of these have long IDP segments. That is, a lot of these proteins have unstructural regions. But if we look at prokaryotic proteins, this doesn't happen. Most pro prokaryotic proteins do have structure. Over half of eukaryotic proteins have parts that are unstructured, right? Some of the reasons might, some of the reasons why um, is that these IDPs are used in signaling and regulation, right? Um, so here is an IDP. Um, let me get my pen back out. Here's an IDP. And when it finds a protein, its target, it will bind in such a way to give it structure. This structure can be used as, a, as some kind of signal, right? Where if this IDP becomes structured, that, that's a signal to the rest of the cell or a signal to other enzymes to do something. So you can think of going from unstructured to structure as a signal. Um, some other ways IDPs um, are used inside the cell, it's kind of like a tether, right? So it's kind of like reaching out into the uh, cytoplasm and trying to grab onto something or interact with something. And so this flexibility allows it to interact.
uh, when it becomes structured, can it, can it becomes unstructured as well? Yeah, so IDPs in this example, you can go back to the other form. So as soon as you're not binding this white protein, you're gonna go back to unstructured, right? Now, the interesting thing about IDPs is that we have found many diseases associated with them. Um, the most famous being Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is um, thought to be caused by an IDP that builds up in your brain. I believe I talk about that next. Uh, I don't. Uh, so let me just talk about that. Um, I might talk about that on Monday, but let me just cover that because we're talking about IDPs. The way generally Alzheimer's work is that in your brain, you have proteins called amyloids, beta amyloids to be more specific. So you have beta amyloids, right? And these beta amyloids are IDPs. What can happen though, is that around your neurons, so this is like, a neuron. The beta amyloid can deposit itself in such a way that it'll become structured. And once it becomes structured, other beta amyloids will start to build on that and build on it and it'll start to build this plaque. When this plaque builds up enough, it will kill the neuron you kill enough neurons in your brain, you start having problems with memory, right? That's one of the things we see. Uh, you start having problems like looking at objects and understanding what they're saying. So one of the tests for Alzheimer's is draw a clock face at 3.30. And one of the early signs of Alzheimer's is I have no idea what that looks like in my mind um, because you killed off those neurons. One of the scary things though, is that Alzheimer's, you know, you see it when you're older, which means those of us who are uh, predisposed to have Alzheimer's in your brain right now, you probably have these plaques slowly building. You probably already have beta amyloids in there. And these plaques are just slowly, slowly, slowly growing until you become at an age where, uh oh, these you have a lot of these plaques and your neurons are kind of dead. So that's just one of the ways IDPs are, are part of diseases. the more you know. So just our final question, so we make sure we understand IDPs. Why do IDPs contain more hydrophilic than hydrophobic residues? Um, I already answered that. So um, because IDPs don't have, no, uh, don't have a hydrophobic core, so no hydrophobic core. And they want to be soluble. So to be soluble, you basically don't want um, hydrophobic residues. Now for B, polylites. Polylice means, you know, amino acid that, may, that has made nothing but lysine. That's what polylice is. Polylice will assume a random coil. If you ever see the word random coil, that means IDP. That means it's a part of a protein that does not have structure. However, it is possible to turn polylice into an alpha helix. So that's actually alpha helix, not a helix. Under what cellular conditions do I, or what conditions of my solution do I need to be in to change polylysine into an alpha helix? This will be our last question of the day. Again, one of these big brain, do you know your amino acids? Acidic, right thinking, wrong direction. Because lysine's already positively charged. What's the opposite of acidic? Nope, polylyse probably will not form an alpha helix next to another structure. It's probable, but probably not likely. Basic, yes. So what is lysine again? Lysine is a positively charged amino acid, right? So let's say I have an amino acid 
or sorry, uh, a protein. That is nothing but positively charged groups. And I want to form an alpha helix. And remember, we talked about alpha helixes. Who can remind us what direction or where do we find our side chains in alpha helixes? Are they like inside the helix? Are they outside the helix? Yes. So on an alpha helix, my side chains are pointing outwards, which means side chains of alpha helix, they will interact with each other. They can feel each other. Positive charges don't want to be near each other. So if you're in an IDP and you're like wet spaghetti, right? You can be in such a way where your side chains aren't interacting with each other. They're just going to be spaced out while you can't be spaced out on an alpha helix. But if I'm in basic conditions, my positive charges become neutral. And so if I just have neutral amino acids, that's more likely to be an alpha helix. So the answer is neutral. That's your logic. Um, this question is really, again, one of those thought-provoking questions of, do you remember what lysine looks like? Do you remember what an alpha helix is? Do you understand what an IDP is? Okay, take all that information for me and put it in an uh, answer. Uh, so it, it is due to pH because you have to lose that positive charge. 5B is an excellent test question. It's too bad I give it the answer to you right here in class. Just imagine if you sat down for your test and you just saw 5B without me talking about it first. That's a lovely test question. But any questions? about anything that we talked about. If not, I will put up a homework. Uh, again, no quiz for Monday. I'll, I'll rename all the folders. I might not get to it to today, but I'll try to get to it Sunday. Make that a 20 point question. I might, I mean, when I'm making tests, sometimes I get lazy and I just copy and paste stuff. You, I can't make it just a test, but so let me go on just a minute, a little bit of a tangent here. There is a professor out there that I read. Um, he, he was just talking about like students in general. And what he would do is he would give out a practice exam. And the practice exam is the same exact questions as his real exam. He doesn't change a thing. And most people still fail it. I try that, that same theory. I will take questions and I will copy and paste them on my test where I've given the answers. And it's amazing how often um, people get it wrong. So I am not opposed to just copy and pasting stuff because that's the test like, did you study? Um, well, on the last test I tried that, like three to four of my questions were copied and pasted from the study guide, so. Um, Chances are I'll probably do that again, um, either from the study guides or from the in-class questions. Uh, does the pH condition change the alpha helix structure as well? Um, it could, um, in that you could affect the backbone um, protonation state. So it might not actually form an alpha helix because it can't hydrogen bond in the backbone. So that's why the uh, question is saying under might work might work. There are practice exams up already. They're already in Blackboard, right? In fact, there were questions from the practice exam that I also copied and pasted on test one. So, you know, they're there. All right, with that, yeah, the previous exams are your practice exams, more or less. Um, with that, that's all the time we have for today. I'll put this up. Um, I'm going to rest my voice because I feel like I'm losing it. And I will see everybody on Monday, hopefully. Take care. Make sure you do your homework.